DA21-10 is indeed a complicated development application. There was letters sent out to surrounding owners that the public period has now been modified and officially commences on the 24th of January 2021 for a period of 28 days. So it's from Wednesday the 24th of February 2021 to Wednesday the 24th of March 2021. So that gives a large window for people submitting comments and this was caused because of the communications where council had given incorrect information stating they were the consent authority when in fact it is the Northern Regional Planning Panel. There has been conjecture as to how this development application was actually lodged why the council actually accepted it. There has been, it suggested that they gave in because they didn't uh, want to be sued, but that actually has nothing to do with it. And as it goes, it's actually here on the cover letter dated the 22nd of December, 2020. So just before Christmas, NCV Enterprises town planner is preparing an electronic lodgement of an electronic version of a development application package. So in this, just before Christmas, before the Tweed Shire Council shuts down for the Christmas New Year break, they are preparing to lodge a development application electronically. At the same time, out at Mount Burrell, I might draw your attention to the image on the left, the bulldozer and the truck that came in and bulldozed two parts of the hill and bared up right to the edges in too many places, right up to the riverfront. This was done at the time their town planner is preparing to put in an electronic lodgement. At the same time, people are starting to arrive and live at the Mount Burrell commercial area. A caravan, a bus, a van, three cars, then a four wheel drive. All these people start showing up before Christmas. As this whole hill is bared up, Illegally, I might add, they were served notice to stop those works because they were illegal. They had no consent to do that. That consent is something that is required in this development application over here and they haven't lodged it yet. So what happened is that over Christmas New Year period, this development application package was lodged electronically. As it goes, when development applications are lodged electronically, the council has 14 days to object to it. If there is no objection, the development application proceeds to be lodged. Now in this circumstance, this is exactly what happened, that over the Christmas shutdown period, the 14 days expired and the electronic development application that was submitted was accepted as lodged because there was no human to actually see that or to object to that. This is a, um, I suppose you could say, a flaw within the council's own system that they have now identified and have remedied that. It will not happen again. There will always be a human being monitoring over any uh, holiday period breaks. One would think though that the 14 days would have to mandate a certain number of business days as is usual terms and conditions with anything that time periods do not include public holidays. 
but the council shut down for the Christmas New Year period and had a two year uh, two year two week break. When they came back, there was a failure to know that that had been lodged. No one knew to look at it. It was automatically lodged, and now there is a development application up for submission because they put this in at Christmas time when there was no one in at council to actually receive it or to actually put in any complaints against it so that it may not actually be lodged at all. One would think that they took advantage and were actually well prepared for this scenario. Not the council and CV Enterprises. Once bitten, twice shy, though, that these things only work once. And within the framework of the Tweed Shire Council, there are also other changes afoot. Here in the planning meeting for the 4th of March 2021, they intend to remove permission for uh, our rural land sharing communities to actually be built within the Shire under the SEPP, which is the this little baby here, State Environment State Environmental Planning Policy 2019. So the at currently, the Tweed Shire Council are listed in two locations in clauses under this, which makes this this policy applicable to them. In the meeting that they are having on the 4th of March 2021, they intend to vote three different options on what to do with removing the permissibility of rural land sharing communities. They have identified that there are 13 lawful rural land sharing communities and uh, what was, sorry, one moment. Now, I've only just started looking into this matter, but I do believe that this matter has been an ongoing issue for several years with the Tweed Shire Council. And it may be looking as if at this meeting, they may actually be taking a vote as to what to finally do about it. Now, some of the issues that you could bring up in DA 21-10 would actually be identified with the concerns that you can raise in what the council have actually pointed out about the um, rural land sharing communities. So I'll just read this. Considerations and intent. History has shown that rural land sharing communities were traditionally formed by like-minded people who sought to share common interests in a communal living habit well-defined communal areas and facilities. The legislation, as seen above, envisage single lots of low-scale development of more than three dwellings, but makes a distinction between other uses such as camping ground, caravan park, eco-tourist facility or tourist and visitor accommodation. There is also a point of difference between multi-dwelling housing given this use is not considered a development standard. Rural land sharing communities have proved problematic over their 30 plus years of existence due to a number of reasons, including but not limited to. Difficulty in obtaining a mortgage to enter a rural land sharing community due to lack of personal assets to leverage against difficulty in leaving the community for similar reasons to the point just mentioned, added burden on the community when members are unemployed, ability to maintain common property, roads, fences, vegetation, etc., especially when the point above applies, when they're talking about unemployment. Maintenance of appropriate bushfire access and asset protection zones. That was actually a concern of mine. Who would actually manage that because it's a huge property and there are lots of issues to manage. And the other points, 
breakdown in social, co social cohesion as members age and attitudes towards communal living change, and difficulty in transferring ownership for dwellings that may not have a lawful approval. So these are already problems that in Council's 30 years history of dealing with these specific types of communities, that there are common problems. And when they say the breakdown in social cohesion as members age, this isn't necessarily um, a thing that's actually got to do with members ageing. What I've seen and experienced is that the breakdown in social cohesion occurs when you fail to agree with the alphas of the pack. You can go into these communities and you can be agreeable, but then there comes a point when you're being agreeable actually means that you are a sheep. So if you don't want to be like that and have an opinion like me, voicing that opinion starts to break down the social cohesion because there is a very clear, clear definition of how you must think and in certain ways the mindset. And these do require, in a way, a cult mentality where everybody is a sheep and they think the same. And if you are not willing to conform to that constant values that other, others place on you, greater restrictions on what your own government does, then there does come the breakdown in social cohesion. And it has got nothing to do with members ageing, it has got everything to do with people being individuals with their own mind, their own thoughts and their ability to express them freely. These are supposed to be communities, oh well everyone's equal and you can all share your opinions equally. Well that's a nice ideal but it doesn't work in practice and this does cause a breakdown in social cohesion. So there are many reasons and as stated by the council that these are certainly not limited to. So this part that you're looking at here on the State Environmental Planning Policy 2019 New South Wales is Schedule 5 and what the Tweed Shire Council seek to do is just get rid of O and P out of here and if that is achieved then rural land sharing communities will no longer be allowed within the Tweed Shire Council. The 13 existing ones will be looked at and modified to bring them in line with certain values that they've actually laid down in, I dare say, their rural land strategy, which was completed, what I think, May last year in 2020. So the Tweed Shire Council actually believe that they have accommodated the flexibility of being able to still set up what was the original ideal of um, a single lot and multiple owners that would share in the ownership of that lot into what has now become well, pardon the term but a bastardized version where it's just turning mass development that would be in the city that now it's been done in the country under the guise of let's make a rural land sharing community. Well in this community that they propose at NICAP on Minjimbal there's not much that they would be actually sharing. All they are doing is providing housing and bringing in a huge more people, traffic and a burden on the unemployment rates, on infrastructures that already cater to doctors and hospitals, ambulance, fire services, all these different basic services that are not provided for in the area will now be overburdened by the intent of all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra people that they would intend to put in this area. And as I've said in the previous video, 
that it would appear that the density that they want to achieve would not be consistent with the state environmental planning policy. Now, considering that if the Tweedshire Council are successful in removing themselves from the state environmental planning policy and rural land sharing communities are no longer um, available to actually build within the Shire, the whole development of Nightcap on Minjimble is actually in question. And in what these planning minutes meeting, the information that they've provided in those six pages has actually stated that it will direct, directly impact a, de, a proposed development in Kunga. So this would be this development because it's certainly not Mebane Springs. Mebane Springs is not a rural land sharing community. It is more like your classic development where everybody's got their own little lot and title and services and you know it, it conforms to basic parameters. So the only one that we can actually assume that they're referring to that will affect a development application is the NICAP on Mingeable. So if you have actually purchased shares in this, it may actually be very fleeting your money. It is probably already gone, as Adrian Brennock has said, any money that you give them is gone in, an, in a heartbeat on, quote, infrastructure, whatever that is. Whatever they want to spend it on, they will do it. If it means spending 100000 on suing somebody because they're speaking out against them, they'll do that. That's what investors' money are for, and that's what infrastructure is, comes under anything they want to apply it. So if the council do vote to remove this, Nightcap on Minjimble will not actually be able to be uh, get approval. And even though it is still being heard through the um, regional panel, and it may say, well, you know, it was lodged prior to these changes, so we have to consider it. Well, in consideration of the changes that would be made to the 13 existing ones, that if they approve Nightcap on Minjimble, it would become the 14th. And then it would also become applicable to all the changes that the other 13 are now un to undergo to conform with local bylaws. So in summary, when it comes to the state envir environmental planning policy or provisions, I would say that as I have described before, that in Schedule, it is Schedule 5, yes, Schedule 5, Clause 2, Aims of the Schedule, Subsection A, Nightcap on Minjimble Development is not a single lot, cannot fulfil that particular clause of the aim, uh, aim of the schedule. Now, as described in the previous video and why, it can not fulfill the aims of A, B, uh, C and D. I mean, ultimately, there is not one of those conditions that they can actually fulfill. There is, as I've described, and you want to know my reasonings, look at the previous video on SCPP, where I describe how I believe that none of those conditions. So the aim of the development does not align with the aims of the schedule. So therefore, by that alone, the development application should not be considered. But then if you go on further, the consent authority may grant development consent to development on land to which this schedule applies for the purposes of three or more dwellings 
if satisfied of the following. Now again, I have discussed these issues in a previous video. So by my definitions, they cannot satisfy in clause B, sub clause 1A, the, the land is a single lot. It is not a single lot, it's 21 lots. They will be violating D, where they will be building on a wildlife corridor, and there is no proposal of how to actually move that wildlife corridor. And I have recently been advised that Peter Van Leishout will not allow people onto the land to actually look for koala scats and other wildlife so that it can be looked at as to what is there and how you may look at proposing a different corridor for them. You cannot do this without the research. So, and there is no, no effective information. Someone has written down, we can put them over here and that's it. There is nothing to say how they intend to achieve that. So for all intensive purposes, they will be building over a wildlife corridor. Then also clause E, subclause E, the development will include, not include a camping ground, caravan park, etc. Misty Mountains caravan, uh, camping and tourist accommodations is part of the development and the development is not seeking approval to operate that within the facility. So that, as I explained, is not permissible in the sense that even if it does have authority, it's not permissible in the sense of the development because they're not seeking permission to operate it within the umbrella of the development. Then in the final subclause G, the development is consistent with the aims of this schedule. And as I've already said, I do not believe that it is consistent with any of the aims of the, this schedule. Then if you go down to the density of the development, which states that the development would result in more than follow, the following number of dwellings on the land, the consent authority must not grant consent to development. So in other words, the development Nightcap or Minjimbal is what 1,584 hectares and it doesn't matter you can only have a maximum of 80 dwellings on there they propose to have 392 and there is also no clear definition of what they actually want to put in the old village area of Peter Van Leishout's to do with DA 06-1054. If there are to be more residential areas going in there along with commercial buildings, there is no details of any of that. So nobody can make an informed decision about what this whole development is because in that respect, there are those details about the village missing as well. You can look at something that Peter Van Leishout wanted to achieve 14 years ago, but what it means today, we cannot see that. And you're, I don't think that even on those that basis alone that anyone can make a decision because how can you say yes and not know what they want to put in that village area? What businesses are going to go in? What infrastructure do they intend to provide? And this would certainly eliminate a lot of the, um, well, things that they are actually not fulfilling in the AIM and other parts of the SCPP. So the density of the development, again, is an issue. So these are things that already I haven't even touched on the ordinary concerns of ordinary people <laughs> that the council are seeking to remove rural land sharing communities from the SCPP or to remove themselves from the SCPP so that they can then take over management of their rural areas 
as is suited for the area. And I think that the Tweed Shire Council, being in the area that it is, and stating too that largely these types of communities were born back in the early 70s when the Aquarius Festival was in Nimbin. And there was more of, well, it was a different attitude, a different time. And that mentality towards um, people communal living is not the same. Everyone still wants their slice of exclusivity. And, uh, I, well, for those that are around and do remember the hippie days, it was a little bit different to that. It's a lot different to what they proposed at Nightcap. There is a certain amount of pattern of behaviour to illegal earthworks that has been that has gone on at Three Triple Two over the last so many years, and Peter Van Leyshout certainly has had his slice of controversy with it as well. But this was done just before Christmas. You can see the Tweed River here and you can see that they've come down with the bulldozer uh, right to the water's edge. There is a 50 metre exclusion zone that you actually need permission to go anywhere between that 50 metres and the river. And they hadn't even put in the development application yet so they certainly didn't have the permission to bulldoze all this, certainly not to do this. That then caused massive erosion and a lot of that ended up in the Tweed River. And if you look back here in some photographs, oh, hang on one moment, here you can see the darkness of the ground as if that's where there's potholes there that water has sat in. Because they did all this in heavy rains. I mean, the sun might be out briefly for a moment there, but it's during a period of very wet weather. And the ground was wet, and there were periods when they were actually doing it in the rain. Bulldozer truck. They've gone in and bulldozed it. And I don't think that, I mean, there is multiple occasions where you can quote both Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry, the developers of Nightcap on Minjimble, as saying, do no harm. Well, there are other things that I'm going to quote them on shortly too, that I can show they're incorrect in. Mark McMurtry made comment on several occasions that there is no development going on near the sacred sites or anything like that, that they're kept well away from it. And the overlay that I've got here on the titles, where you can see all the little dots, are the heritage locations that have been identified through the NCV Enterprises application in the documents that they provided. These are the locations of heritage spots. Now before I actually show you a little bit further, I will point out the results that I've actually looked at today to discover that there are, according to what the results came up at the Aboriginal Heritage Information management services. That 25 lots that I put in of all those lot numbers and even the, the road bits up here too, there were all, all these results that came back. I then compared them to the results that were provided by NCV Enterprises. Now an interesting thing is that on this website it says that doing these searches actually qualifies as doing, doing due diligence. That's where I said here, um, it actually covers due diligence requirements. So if you've checked on this website and checked to see if there's anything there, well then 
you know you have done a certain level of due diligence and that's only on a basic search you can do extensive searches which clearly they would give you more information on what I don't know but basic searches must include every key location on their database I dare say extensive searches give you more pre precise locations because all they do is just state there is 11 results or something like that they don't actually tell you where they are but the discrepancies that I discovered through there in comparing them with Nightcap or Mingimbal's um, all their data is that there's a variance in some areas they added sites that weren't there others they excluded and in all there were six added records in lot numbers that didn't have the number in them like here the result was one but NCV are showing two so they've added extra ones there so there's been six um, locations added records and there are 10 records that are missing or 10 locations that come up on this basic search that are not listed but that's just uh, something that I will mention in passing right now because as per Mark McMurtry's state statement he said that none of these areas here any of these areas will actually be developed upon. Well, I just want to bring up a couple of things. One moment. Okay, so now before I turn this overlay off so it's actually easier to see, I've just put dots over where their dots are. So we'll take the overlay off. Now I'm going to put the houses on the roads. And it's not, not looking too bad, is it? But now I'm going to put the exclusive use lot areas over where the houses are. Whoops. So what you have here now is that each one of these green one represents 2.47 acres of exclusive use. And if you start to look over the areas you see that a lot of exclusive use areas are overlapping into these areas. But the most specific of all that was actually said is by Mark McMurtry that they are keeping well away from the burial ground, that there is no development going on anywhere near it. And yet that is the only burial ground that they have marked and it actually falls pretty much on the border of two excuse, exclusive use lots. So for the comment that it is preserving heritage sites, the statement that they are staying well away from these sacred areas, the keeping burial site is nowhere near any of the development. It's part of someone's exclusive use lot. There are, as I showed you before, these yellow ones represent the sites that were registered that they couldn't find. And there is, as I said, the absence of so many other registered areas that are not mentioned in this well in this chart this chart should actually be representative of all the information that they have on the heritage areas within the whole development area but there's no mention of any over here in what is lot 121 one lot 121 has got a lot of um, aboriginal heritage sites in it and yet there is nothing mentioned. Originally in DA 06-1054, Peter Van Leishout's heritage report, I think was what, one page that said there's nothing there. And then we find out that 
it did actually become an issue that there were things on this site. Oh, hang on. So there is one there, sorry. But there is actually, I think um, that's actually not on lot 121. L lot 121 has got a lot of um, heritage sites registered on it. Now, this little diagram within here is actually a representation of the 27 buildings that was originally conceived by Peter Van Leishout. It is highly possible that these 27 commercial buildings, conference centre, whatever, will actually continue to go in, maybe just a slight modification to the plan. As I've explained, don't know what he intends to do with that. So I've just overlaid the wildlife corridor now. The proposed one in the orange and the current one in the green. And as you can see that the development intends to take up a large part of the current wildlife corridor, aims to send it over, there are three access points into the community. This is one of them. This will be a very busy road for many people, hundreds of people up through here will come in this entrance. And they propose to push animals through this corridor. I do not think that they will cooperate. I do not think it is even, there is not enough land he, between here and here trees as a barrier to be a corridor for them. It has just reduced it too much. And as I showed in a previous video, this land that ends up being really all that is left up here amounts to 268 odd acre hectares, sorry, out of nearly 1600 hectares. So that means that the whole development consumes and ties up around 14,000, or let's say generously 13,000 hectares, uh, 1,300 hectares, sorry, and leaves 268 for uh, natural habitat. I think that is an unacceptable reduction in and damage to the natural ecosystems, the thriving habitats, the flora and fauna, and especially when it comes to the vulnerability of koalas, especially after the last bushfire season, where they are thriving, we need to let them thrive. And currently they are thriving through here, they love it. And any development in this area will put them off. Koalas are secluded animals, seclusive. They, common sightings are not, well, it's not a regular occurrence for people to see koalas, unless you go somewhere and you have a photograph taken with one and they're not so cuddly. But to be in a place where there is that little human traffic through there, that they actually are seen. That is not that easy to come across. So the more that these habitats are protected, the, well, the more the koala population can actually bounce back after last year's devastating fires. What they propose to do in building over the wildlife corridor is in breach of the conditions does of the SEPP and it does not um, conform with the aims of the schedule and there is nothing to indicate how they would turn this orange bit, how they would actually make animals go this way. What they're going to do is just build in here and push animals out. Right, so I want to get through a few issues here so that um, it, this doesn't end up being too long. Now, it's already been raised about the lack of maintenance in these rural land sharing communities. 
and that had already been a concern of mine. There are lots of places, like down here already, there is a bus. Now on this map it actually looks like, well hey, no biggie, you should be able to get to it. But in reality it is surrounded by high bracken ferns and it is inaccessible. It could not be inspected. Now a bushfire would take off through there. There is a lot of concern too with the level of rubbish that has been left around. There are this abandoned bus, there's another abandoned vehicle over here. Rubbish has been dumped up here's the main house at 3222. Rubbish has been dumped up here and if you go over here to Shane um, Shane Morrison, he's the caretaker for Peter Van Lyshout. His house looks like it's been set up in a dump too. I mean there is clear evidence in so many places and even the images that are provided through the documentations uh, with the development application 21-10 that actually show that there is no maintenance, there is no removal of rubbish, there is no caretaking of these things. So ultimately they do become an issue and where they do become an issue especially with bushfires is that if bushfire accesses are not maintained if the tanks are what if there's a fire the rural fire services come in each one of these houses has got a tank that you're supposed to be able to use but they ran out of water so they used that water and it's empty what happens then so these are things that who monitors these things? And there are a lot of concerns too about Peter Van Lyshout was to actually have a fire truck for emergency services and another requirement was also a community bus. Now actually speaking of past costs of Peter Van Lyshout, done some more investigating into the claim 20,000 bridge cost and it has been discovered it was nowhere near that amount. So the amount of what it would have cost may more have been in the vicinity of say two to four million. Uh, that's only a rough guesstimate that is not actually um, going on anything that I've actually seen. Just as to say that the expenditure that I'd said was going to be 20 million a bridge. It was actually hard to see how it could cost that. And now I've, found, I've discovered that, well, it's still going to cost quite a few million, but not 20 million. So I just thought I'd raise that anyway, because it's not going to be any good for bushfire services if they can't get over bridges and the current condition of all of those bridges, especially this one here. I've seen re uh, photographs of it recently where it is in terrible condition and I really don't think that it could bear the load of heavy vehicles which is why, let me just show you what traffic looks like currently up Mandalay Road. So this is the um, activities that go on up and down Mandalay Road all day, every day, every day of the week. Various trucks and, oh, except for the log truck. The log truck is in there because when they start chopping down all the trees for these one acre clearing around each of these houses, they're going to have to remove the logs somehow. So they're going to need a log truck. Everything else though there, um, water trucks, cars, dump truck, service vans, concrete trucks, semis, other vans, all these things, cars. And then the special delight of up here in the Misty Mountains. I've created a visual here of a full camp of 15 tent sites and two cabins that are fully occupied. and. I'm giving an overcrowding of the tents because somebody decided that one tent site was going to make three people, three tents can fit in there. So yeah, I squashed them in there. I was overly generous. 
these people travel up and down these roads as well. It is only sealed up into about this corner up here and then it becomes dirt roads. From here on down it's a fairly steep downhill road. There are, I've also have photographs that uh, not so long ago this whole bridge is just flooded. You can't even see the bridge, it doesn't exist. So this brings to question the level of traffic already on existing roads, which not only includes Mandalay Road, but Kyogel Road itself. As uh, any locals know, there are good patches and bad patches along that road. And the last thing you need is perhaps another thousand vehicles a day coming in and out of here. All these trucks, uh, there's 392 development uh, dwelling lots, need trucks to bring in the water tanks and construct their buildings and their sewerage treatment plants and all these things in and out, in and out, in and out, all the time for years. This creates a high level of noise, constant hum, and in the country it's really annoying because the only thing you want to hear are the birds and the chirping of the crickets and the running of the river or anything like that. Not the sound of heavy machinery constantly going. And also too, the level of dust that it creates. There is over around 50 kilometres of existing road. They're only going to look at 26 and a half kilometres of that road, but they're widening that from two metres to six metres. That's going to be six metres wide of 26 and a half kilometres of very dusty, dirty roads. And in the dry season over winter, those dusty roads are then going to accumulate the dust on the plants at the side. This will actually affect photosynthesis and it will start killing the plants. It actually affects plant growth with the accumulation of dust. It suffocates them. Then the next big downpour of rain you have, that might be a relief for the plants, but it's not going to be a relief for the water catchment areas because um, there is actually no clear indication of where they actually intend for the um, drains on either side of these 26 and a half kilometres where that storm water will feed off to. Where all that dirt that is washing off the sides of the plant, where it's washing off the roads and down into the water catchment areas, how they've actually even accommodated for that. And there's also the fact of too that when you're building on here, like any place, you're going to have a setback. Every one of these houses may be very limited on how far back they can actually get from the road. You have to consider there's going to be a road that they're going to build for you to get in, but you also have to build your road to actually get into your exclusive use area. So, and some of them, because of slope restrictions, you may not actually be able to put a road in. So you will have to actually construct your own road in and clear your acre of trees to actually build your house on. That's work that you have to do before you can even build it. Unless you get one of these ones that's already cleared or down over here where they bulldozed it, you'll be right. Well, you'd be right if they had development approval and they had uh, stage development approval and consent to actually sell the lots and people start habitating there but they don't even have that. They've just lodged the application. And the ability for that application to actually stand within existing laws is looking greatly in jeopardy now. Now to follow on from the dusty roads, the rain, this heavy sediment, I tried to find out when these dams, these man-made dams were actually constructed and I was told that perhaps roughly 1988 and they are not lined. So in all the time that is occurred since if it was then there has been a heavy 
mineralization and heavy sediments that have ended up in these dams. It was also noted in the documents that's that forms part of the DA21-10 that these uh, dam water qualities would need to actually be tested and that they are highly mineralised with a high level of sediment. And that sediment has come from initially these areas over here were heavily logged there would have been a lot of activity that would have ended up in the initial place, first place. Then after 20 years, it all starts to grow back. Water starts running in there. There's very little activity on these roads, very little runoff. Because you'd have to imagine that for it to get so highly mineralized with all that sediment, it has to be carried from somewhere. And the only loose places it could be carried from is in flood situations where it's dragged off the dirt roads. And it's only where cars loosen the topsoil of the dirt will it actually wash away so much. Yes, in heavy rains it will just erode and wash it out anyway. It will really chew out the dirt roads. So in one season alone, wet season, summer, you would need to regrade perhaps several dirt roads. The issue of who is going to maintain the ongoing grading of roads was anyone that's lived in an area where you've needed to access um, through a dirt road, you know that every year you can need your road grading because it gets that bad from the rain washing it out. And then the dry cars, trucks, or anything else that may come along, digging it all out and sending it up as dust, and it settles on the side of the road, not back on the road. So all of these issues have already started to create areas, as far as I'm concerned, in the water quality of what's actually in a lot of these dams. There was also, too, that in the past there has been the heavy use of um, pesticides like Roundup to control and manage weeds and anything like that can also end up washed into these dams. So the fact that there is no water quality testing done or projections on the stormwater is of high concern. But it's also been pointed out in the recent letter that I showed you. One moment. This letter sent to surrounding landowners. It also is made special note here. And I haven't checked into these um, ones yet. But the provisions that are talked about in here. Now the fact that it's made special note of uh, is the point of, well, perhaps this answers the fact that Planet, their consultant, their town planner, had decided that because the Gold Coast and Logan councils didn't require certain testings, that they didn't have to do it either. So when they submitted their application electronically, they never included stormwater quality projections, monitoring and mitigation of any risks and contaminations that might actually occur. See, up here in this area too is actually an old cattle dip. Now, there, it is confusing as to what may have actually occurred there, but it's said that apparently it was concreted. The, the soil was removed and the area concreted, so essentially, you know, they decontaminated the area. Um, I don't know. They were not able to verify that. So... Then with the water quality of what goes into the dams, what goes into the water catchment areas, there's also the concern that I've raised in the past of all these places in heavy flooding rains when their sewerage treatment irrigation hoses are set to automatically release when it gets to a certain level. It can be pouring down with rain and grey water systems are just pumping out refuse 
into a landscaped area that it's never going to stay on there it's just going straight with the flow of all the other water and it ends up in some water catchment now none of these projections have been done as part of the stormwater monitoring and quality of water control which was actually done by Cardno for that much smaller area over there so when I look at another factor that actually involves fires we are looking at how many of these places in winter will have a wood fire how many of them will take the trees that have been chopped down and burn them in a wood fire how much of that smoke on still nights will sit in the mountain tops and just condense in the fact that smoke actually consists of fine particles in still environments they can end up settling on the ground and wood ash has got in most circumstances a very high pH affectability so it can actually make alkaline soils even more alkaline with the accumulation I am I'm not a geologist or a tester in any way that how long it would actually take for uh, how many years of people burning smoke fires in this area during winter for there to be an accumulation of wood particles um, ash that has fallen on the ground it may be hard to determine because a lot of that would then get washed off in the rainy weather and these are this is a very big concern of what ends up washed off what goes on the land and what ends up washed into the water catchments not only on the Beryl Creek side but on the Tweed River side as well now one problem that I did have was actually uh, living up to the expectation of what they provided in saying that everyone has 2.47 acres of exclusive use there are 40 um, areas where you cannot practically achieve that now here that is actually a house and there is also another little building tucked in there you cannot build a house here and take up an acreage uh, 2.47 there when you would be taking that house and part of the sawmill uh, in some circumstances like in this one that's um, a hay shed there again there are certain places where it would be inclusive but in this area you would actually be building on someone else's house there house is, would be in your exclusive use area now there are lots of areas that I have not covered yet <laughs> and one of the things actually involves also one of the provisions in the state environmental planning provisions that s says about camping and tourist accommodations now there are places that we can't actually identify the location of but they are located within Peter Van Lyshout's land and they are for all intensive purposes a registered camping spot you can actually search them on the internet and the thing is that these places like this one is actually I think noted and called Camp 6 there's one that it's not the lookout over here but there's also another camp here so ultimately there are allocated camping areas within the development application area or the development envelope and yet there's no mention of conducting though using those camping areas as camping areas as renting them out as hiring them out as is currently done again 
This is something that is not clarified about the use of Misty Mountains over here. They have said that they do not intend to do anything with it and yet it is surrounded by exclusive use areas. So it is a little bit hard to understand, well, they have actually, Planet, have actually identified that the strip of land, I think, comes down a little bit like that. Thin strip of land. That's actually where Planet says that all of this is. This thin strip of land down here. So in that misidentification, they cannot actually see that, no, it's not that thin strip down there. It's got, it's right in amongst the houses. You can't stick a camping site in amongst people's housing. It just isn't on. So there is activity happening too up here at Dolph Cook's place. He's um, constantly got trucks in and out and going up and down. There were seven concrete trucks that went up Mandalay one day. That's 50, around 50 cubic metres of concrete. So with all the other trucks that have been going up and down and up and down, <laughs> what's been going on up there? Well, the council are going to inspect and find out. And when they find out, when I find out, I'll let you know, if I'm allowed to know, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right, I went into a lot more detail about the um, proposal with the council and the SEPP than I planned. I wanted to make this video an all-encompassing, I've got pages of notes here, with all the areas of concern. but. The video is getting a little long. I think I might finish it up here and actually do a separate video where I can just deal with each issue and not get sidetracked and explained but make reference to the videos like this where I may explain things a little bit further. Because there's an interesting point too that has been brought, well, they've, it's raised my um, attention anyway when I saw the shareholders agreement now after seeing the trust deed and knowing all about what happened at Buller Buller and Lumber and Horizons and the past lost investors and not being able to prove their legal position the trust deed was illegal now we've got a shareholders agreement now the thing is that a shareholders agreement means that you have got shares and if you have got shares that means you actually have to be a proprietary limited company either a public or a private company but to have shares to be a shareholder you actually have to be a shareholder in a company a proprietary limited now NCV Enterprises has not taken on any new shareholders any of the members, company associates, proprietary com limited companies have not taken on any new shareholders. They're basically all the same shareholders at the top level of the development that are reaping in the rewards. And the shareholders, the investors that are buying in, cannot buy in under a shareholders agreement unless there is a company vehicle for them to actually buy in as a shareholder too. And as the concept goes with them is that you buy in and you become a shareholder and you control all the company assets. So the one company that you can be a shareholder in that will control all the other assets, you have to be written down on paper at ATSIC as a shareholder. That's what a shareholders agreement is. You cannot be a shareholder if, well, I'm in an, a, an incorporated association and I've got a shareholders agreement. You can't have shares in an incorporation or an incorporated association. You can only have shares in a proprietary limited company, whether it's private 
which means that it's not listed on the stock exchange or public where it is listed on the stock exchange. Essentially, the only way you can actually have a shareholders agreement is to be a proprietary limited company. So for the 40 people that are said now to actually make up the members of Nightcap or Mingenbull, there would have to be, for those people that have bought in, a registering of them as a shareholder through the company vehicle that owns all the assets that they are actually now a, an equal shareholder in. There is no company vehicle for that. No proprietary limited company. It may be hidden in an incorporation or an association or anything like that. But if it's hidden, it also cannot be proven and you will not have a leg to stand on if you need to verify your legal position. And here I will come back to what the council said. These main issues surrounding rural land sharing communities have already shown up in so many ways when it was Bulla Bulla, Lumban Horizons, uh, Mount Warning Eco Village, all the different names that it has come under. There have been, there has been the ideal and the aspiration and then there has been reality and the inability of the ideal to meet reality and the practical cost of actually trying to achieve these things because there are so many costs that have actually not been stated as considerations. For one, the fire truck, the um, community bus and the ongoing cost each year of what it will take and who will actually maintain the conditions of the roads that will maintain condition and ensure that for emergency services purposes the roads are clear and their emergency water tanks are available and who will monitor all the 392 places that you know they haven't got a whole great big paddock of their acre cleared that is dead grass and you know, one night they might get a little bit drunk or something and drop a match and woof up it goes. That's another thing to consider is the carelessness of the people that have been attracted to these places, this place in the past. There's been an accidental fat fire. Just recently there was a fire where someone's um, house was burnt down. And, uh, well, I won't go too much into the details about what's said about that, but the th there is actually quite um, an alarming occurrence of um, fire call-outs to actually places on this property, more than I've actually heard of. I mean, to actually hear of a call-out to one place, but to actually have a pattern of behaviour, it seems, over time, where people make careless mistakes, do stupid things. And one of the most common causes are candles. People leave candles going and they go to sleep and they cause fires. Uh, this is a common thing. And uh, it doesn't have to be particularly in, in a rural land sharing community. People have done it all over. So on that note, I'm going to finish this video and discuss all of the issues in one. I think I might have actually covered a fair lot of them anyway in what I've discussed. But to highlight each area more clearly and more specifically. The areas of concern that I have, some of them aren't concerns, but more that more information is required. More information on the quality stormwater projections monitoring, more information on the village, more information on the bridges, more information on costings, more information on how do you achieve to move the wildlife corridor, 
more information on how do you give these people that you cannot practically give them 2.47 in the allocated house lot. How do you practically intend to give them their other 1.47 acres? All of these ones are an acre, these orange ones, and there's 40 of them. There's a lot over here. A lot. So there's a lot that requires more information. I'd also like more information on why there are not enough heritage sites, why I can do my basic due diligence search and I had to register to do that search too, uh, to find out and do a search on each individual lot to see if there's any listing of a heritage site there. So why are there so many that are not included in this development application? There are many sites that are not included and there have been extra ones that have been added. And these, this area over here should have 11 locations of heritage site and noted what they are. And there's not even one noted on lot 121. Actually, I take that back. I think that might still be... Hang on, we'll just check that. No, I was incorrect about that. This keeping burial and these two AHMS sites not found are on lot 121. But they're supposed to be, I think from memory, about 11 that are supposed to be on this site. And they've only got... Well, they found one and they couldn't find the other two. And this one is of the biggest concern of all. I mean, this is like building around the cemetery. You don't do that. And they have included it in the exclusive use areas. Mark McMurtry said it would not be part of the development. And it is. Or the developable areas. It'll be right away from them, he said. What a load of. Anyway. On that note, I'm going to say goodbye and I'll talk to you in the next one. <laughs> Bye.